out on me, Lord, your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me, your love. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Hey, that wasn't good enough. How's everybody doing? All right. Hey, a couple of things before we get started. Go ahead and greet your neighbor. Give a high five. Give a hug. Fist bump. Tell them you're glad they're here. All right. Again, glad you're here. Hope everyone had a good Thanksgiving. I ate plenty of turkey, took some power naps, was disappointed by the Cowboys, but that's all right. Um, what we'll do, go ahead right now, um, we just want to take the opportunity, if you haven't had a chance to fill out one of our Connect cards, our ushers would love to get you one if you want to raise your hand, and just more for us to get to know you. Um, also, if you need an offering, um, they'll go ahead and pass those envelopes, so ushers, if you'll go ahead and pass those out for us right now, and again, just simply raise your hand, we will not try to embarrass you get those passed out. A um, couple things we want to go over. I'm not sure if you've heard, but we have something called Parents Days Out. And what that is, um, December 7th from 1030 to 130 at our offices um, on North, uh, excuse me, 910 South Treadway. Uh, it's just a time you can drop off your kiddos, whether you need to do some Christmas shopping, you need a break, whatever it is. They're going to be doing some fun stuff, some decorate, uh, decorations, doing some cookies. Um, but one thing you have to do, you have to sign up for that, okay? So today is the last day for sign up. So come see me after church. If you have any questions with that, we'll get with Amanda. Uh, she will get you taken care of. But again, you got to make sure you signed up so we kind of prepare for that with, uh, with having enough ornaments, cookies, and those type of things. So um, next thing we want to talk about is called Next Steps. That's going to be next Sunday at 1 p.m. So what Next Steps is, um, it's, it's a great way to learn about the church, right? What the mission is, uh, what our plans on the future are, and kind of how the church got started. So uh, you can sign up for that. There should be some information out front uh, at our Connect station. Go ahead and fill that out uh, if you'd like to participate. Lunch will be provided, but literally from here you'll go to the office. Again, that's at uh, 910 South Treadway. So really good opportunity. Um, again, if you have a question, just pop with us afterwards and we can answer those questions for you. So one thing we also want to go to, uh, connect groups. Uh, if you haven't heard about that, um, you know, we're a church of, of small groups. We're, we're a church of getting to know each other and, and doing life together. And what, what our connect groups is, is it's just an opportunity to do that once a week. Uh, due to the holidays and the busy season, we'll take a break from that. So literally from December 11th, through February 3rd. Uh, we'll have a break and then February 3rd we'll sign up. So uh, you can go to our website and click on the small groups link and you can sign up for uh, different types of small groups. I want to say there's three or four small groups. Is that right? So um, find one that works for you. Um, but it just is a great a great thing we have going here. We'd love, to, love for you to be a part of that. So um, that is really what we have right now. We'll go ahead and collect those Connect cards and offerings here in a little bit. Before we go back to, to church, if you can please join me in prayer. Dear Lord, I just want to thank you for the opportunity today to, to come and worship you, Lord. And uh, I want to thank you for, for everything. I want to thank you to be able to come to a place where, where we can be at home. Not only with Connect Church, but with you, Lord. And no matter what we did yesterday, what we did last night, what we've done in our past, that does not matter, and our sins have been forgiven, Lord. So if there's anything that are standing in our minds or in our ways to, to worship and hear your word, I just I pray for those distractions to go away, Lord, and just thank you for this opportunity. Amen. Honey, I believe that the presence of Jesus changes things. You can say amen to that. The presence of Jesus changes things. I think calling on his name changes things. The hopeless situations not can be changed, but are changed because of Jesus. This next song is kind of just a proclamation of that, saying, Lord, I love you. One, because you first loved me, and I know that in my love for you, 
and your love for me that it changes things. I might see destruction or whatever chaos in front of me. When I look at all of that, even through, through you, it changes. So this song just says, when you walk into the room, everything changes. Darkness starts to tremble at the light that you bring. When you walk into the room, every heart starts burning. And nothing matters more than just to sit here at your feet and worship you. So I don't know what your week was like. Maybe you had a, an awesome Thanksgiving. Maybe it was chaos with family. Maybe you're just, I can't wait for people to leave. Uh, but I pray that this morning you're able to just sit at his feet and worship. That's our prayer for each one of us this morning. That we're able to just encounter him and sit at his feet and just worship him this morning. One, because he first loves us. So when you walk into the room, everything changes. Darkness starts to tremble with the light that you bring. Oh, your love is strong. This next part is my favorite part. It says your love vanquished all my enemies. It broke the cage that silenced me and set the songbird free. And it says, I sing for all the love you've given me. Rejoice because you've chosen me. And oh, your love is strong, 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 strong. Oh, your love is strong. to be loud. Aren't you guys glad you're here? Come on, man. Aren't you glad that you are in the house of the Lord? Amen. Man, I'm so glad that we are here. I'm so glad to see your faces. I know some of you were expected to see a tall guy from Arkansas. It's okay. 
I did you a favor. I sent him somewhere else. You got a short dude from Texas, all right? So, man, if that don't get you fired up, jacked up, and pumped up, something's wrong with you. So we've been on a series lately. Uh, pastor started it called Permission to Dream. So we're going to continue on that series. Now, listen, he, he is a visionary. I'll, I'll say that about our pastor, man. We are blessed to have a guy that has, has vision. He has the ability to see things. I remember when we were about to launch the church, uh, and this, this used to be a little section back in the back corner. We, like, had this little pen that we would shove kids into and just tell them to leave us alone, and we would meet over there. But I remember when, when Pastor Adam had the vision for what this could be here. And I remember there were a bunch of these old hotel chairs. You remember when you used to go to the old, like, hotel ballrooms back, you know, us old folk, back when you had proms and those types of things, and they had them real cushy chairs with the gold on the side that you just naturally rock because the person before you had bent it on its back two legs. You know, those, they were in here, and he had to set them up. And I remember he's like, do you guys see the vision? Do you guys see what this could be? And I'm like, these chairs smell bad. I smell it. I don't quite see it. You know, and, and he said, well, this is where we're going to have Sunday service. We're going to launch over here. So he had a dream. He had a dream of what he wanted it to be, what God had placed inside of him. Then you have me. I'm not real good at that kind of thing. I could dream. I'm an idea guy. I can come up with a million ideas. I can't execute my way out of a paper bag. Okay? I'm just like, I walk up to the paper bag. I see the paper bag. And I wonder... Who's going to open the paper bag for me? I'm just that guy. That's who I am. But I tell you this. I have the permission to dream that Jesus is my future. Listen, listen, I have the ability to dream that. This week, Pastor Adam told me, you're going to be preaching. You're going to bring it. Bring the heat, bring the fire, bring the lit. You know, he's getting me. And I'm like, yeah, I'm going to bring it. I'm super busy at work. I don't have time to study. I don't know what I'm going to pray. Like, all of a sudden, I became like a Pentecostal gospel preacher, like, by myself. I'm like, and I don't have a clue what I'm going to preach on. Ha. You know? And so I went through that whole time, and I'm like, yeah. So last night, man, I'm sitting at my laptop. Okay, first of all, I'm supposed to get off work. My dear brother, who I will not name, his name's Abel, uh, he kept me late at work. And I'm supposed to leave at 6, about 7-something. I'm getting out of there, and I'm, like, starting to get real upset. Number one, I love Abel. Number two, like, I'm sitting there for a customer that can't buy. So it was super annoying, right? So we leave, and I go home. My wife, she's awesome. If you haven't met her, her name's Amanda. She's the bomb.com. Love her, love her, love her. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Chill out, though, but she's married. I don't know if that was any of you guys. I mean, like, we'll just put this aside. Hold up. All right, anyways, so... She had gotten a table cleaned off. There was coffee pot going. She had the laptop charged. She sit, sat it down. She said, honey, you was a glorified. She didn't do that. But she said, sit down and study. I said, I'm going to watch football. And she's like, but I said, sit down and study. And I said, but I'm going to watch football. So I needed a moment. So I sat down. We watched football. And then she literally, <laughs> she put her hand on my shoulder. She looked over at me real sweet. And she goes, honey, it's time. And I was like, mind your business. Uh, so I got up and went to the table like she told me to because uh, it was time. And I sat down, and I'm starting to write this sermon, right? And I talked to, to different people. I'm like, I'm going to talk about I am. I am the way. I am the, you know, I was going on this long list of things, and I wrote one of the most amazing theological sermons I had ever written. And I'm like, that's it. And then I started another one because that was not it. That was what I wanted to talk about. But I'm listening to this song by Hillsong called I Surrender. And I'm like through my sermon and I'm listening to this I Surrender song. And I start like welling up with tears. As I'm listening to this song about our risen Savior, about Jesus. Man, I start to well up with tears. My emotions start to, to, to start to play. So I put the song on repeat and I listen. And I listen, and I'm like, man, I don't understand. Like, I've got this sermon. I've got the seven I am's in, in, the, in the New Testament. I've got it all down. I made a slide. I mean, it's good. And it is for somebody else. But it's not good for what God has called me to do and what God has given me permission to dream about. And listen, God's given me the permission to dream about Jesus. 
Jesus is my future. Listen, Jesus needs to become your foundation of everything that you do in life. If you're taking notes, write that down. Jesus needs to be my foundation. Listen, you can listen to a million different sermons that tell you how awesome you are and how you can do this and how you can accomplish this, and none of that matters if you don't have Jesus. That's just the truth. It starts with Jesus, and I've got great news for you. It ends with him too. Listen, I've read the end of the book. Going to spoil it for you. We win. Listen, we conquer death. We conquer sin. But we don't do it without Jesus. Because Jesus is our future. So if you have your Bibles with me, we're going to go back to the basics and some foundational things, some foundational beliefs for our permission to dream. So if you have your Bible or you have your smartphone, if you have a dumb phone, look at your friend next to you that has a smartphone and ask him, <laughs> hey, uh, Romans chapter 8. We're going to start with verse 1. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. That is found in the New Testament. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. I'm going to read out of the New Living Translation. But the first point that I would like to make is that there is no condemnation in Jesus. If you read in verse 1, it says, So now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus Christ. There's a key point there. It doesn't say, but there is no condemnation. It says there is no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus. And because you belong to him, meaning Jesus, the power of of the living, or I'm sorry, the power of the life-giving spirit, key word, has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. See, the law of Moses was unable to save us because of the weakness of our sinful nature. So God did what the law could not do. He sent his own son in the body, like the bodies we sinners have, and in that body, God declared an end to sin's control over us by giving his son as a sacrifice for our sins. Verse 4, he did this so that the just requirement of law would be fully satisfied for us, who no longer follow our sinful nature, but instead we follow the Spirit. See, listen, for nine and a half years, I was wrapped up, like a Christmas present. I like to view it as a can of biscuits. You ever seen a can of biscuits wrapped up? The ones you're like scared to put on the counter. You're like, I really wish my wife was here to pop these. You make sure your kids are gone. So when it pops and you scream, nobody sees. <laughs> oh, just me? Yeah, that's cool. Whatever, dudes. Uh, it's cool. Y'all know y'all don't know how to make handmade biscuits. So anyways, I, I, I was wrapped up in sin like a thing of biscuits. You know? And so the, the peeling came off. And I'm looking, I'm like, man, this sucker didn't pop yet. But you can look at the seam and see that that sucker's about to <laughs> just pop. Why is that? Because the wages of sin is death. Listen, I was on the brink of death. Maybe not physical, I don't know, but for sure spiritual. And maybe physical. You want something fun? You want something fun to do? You want to see about the guy that's up here preaching and what God can do? Google on your phones when you get home. Abilene Poker House Robbed. Have fun with that. I'm that. I'm one of those guys. Two years ago, I'm so wrapped up in my sin that I'm sitting in a poker house in Abilene, Texas, gambling thousands and thousands of money. Thousands. And some guys break in, bust in with an AR-15 and two guns. And guess what? I'm sitting at the table. It's a robbery. And not like, a, hey, give me all your money. Like, put the gun to your head kind of robbery. So I did what any smart boy who kind of grew up in the hood a little bit did. All the other white gentlemen who did not were sitting at the table. I jump in the floor. I'm just throwing out there, man. It's harder to shoot a snake on the ground than a bird in a tree. What's up? You know, but I dive on the ground, and as I'm down, literally smelling the carpet, I had the audacity to ask that God rescue me from that situation. I had the guts to do, I knew better. But death 
comes that quickly. At that moment, when those gentlemen were going around the table, digging in people's pockets, putting a pistol to people's heads, telling them that they will kill them if they do not give up what's in their pockets. At that moment, there was only one way that I get out of that situation. And that's God. Because that can of biscuits was about to bust. But I was living in my sinful nature. See, I wasn't believing that there was no condemnation. I had felt that I was too far gone. I had slid down the slope too far. There was no way that I could be rescued. There's nothing I could do. I can't do this. I can't do that. I, my, my family's messed up. My this, my that. And I had every excuse in the world as to why I won't look Jesus in the eye and just flat tell him no. Because that's exactly what I was doing. But I'm here to tell you that there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ. For the things that you have done in your past and the sinful nature that you have lived in that you feel like you can't get up out of, you're wrapped up in, you're like that can of biscuits ready to bust. It's simple. You call upon the name of Jesus. You ask him to come live in your life. You say you want to be devoted to him. And you watch what Jesus does because he will take you from a girl that was in prison and he will take you to getting baptized. He will take you from a guy that was in a poker house that was wrapped up in sin for nine and a half years that left prescription pills more than he loved his own family and he will take him from that moment and two years later he will put him behind a pulpit to tell you that Jesus is not done with you that is what we serve when we serve a risen savior that is the impact of Jesus being your future and people I'm not here to tell you anything else but Jesus is good. Jesus is good. Sin bad. Jesus good. It's, I mean, straight up, it's that simple. But we find comfort in our sinful nature. Because we are born into this world as, as sinners. But God. But God. But God. One T, not two. But God. But sometimes two. Because he'd be butting all up in our business sometimes. Sometimes two. And the second point that I want to make is simple. God loves you. Remember, we're setting the foundation for our permission to dream. The first one is there's no condemnation. The second one is simple. God loves you. Well, you don't know, preacher man. Well, good thing I'm not a preacher man. Well, you don't know, JB. My mom's real name's Jonathan. Well, you don't know, big fella. Ha <laughs> ha, half the man I used to be. <laughs> God loves you. God loves you. Turn in your Bibles to the chapter or the book of John, starting in chapter 3. Verse 16 through 17. And you say, oh, man, I want something deep. I want something deep. I'm here to tell you that there is nothing deeper in the Bible than salvation. There's no other great revelation that you can find by learning the Greek and the Hebrew. and digging. The greatest revelation that you will ever find and the one thing that you can always believe in and always study is salvation and what Jesus did for you. So if you're sitting there and you say, man, I really wanted a deep theological discussion about how David slaying the giant relates now to Jesus and how we can conquer things. I'm not your dude, okay? Because this is what I know. I know Jesus is my future. And I know that God loves me. So John 3, 16, we're going to read out of the New Living Translation because it's the only one I understand. Starting in verse 16, it says, For this is how God loved the world. He, meaning God, gave his one and only Son, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. But if you ask me, what's your favorite verse in the Bible? It's verse 17. God sent his son into the world, not to judge the world, but to save the world through him. See, listen, Jesus came to save us from our sinful nature. Why? Because God loves you. God loves you so much 
that the greatest revelation you can understand is that he sent his only son to die for you. But I have, I have news. It's not just you. He died for all of humanity. Because, listen, we are a deprived people. We are a lost people. And without Jesus, I hate to tell you this, but on the other side is not where we want to be. But with Jesus. Because I'm going to tell you this. One day with Jesus is better than a thousand without him. How do I know? Been there, done that, got the t-shirt. Also ate the carpet when I was down there on the carpet and the guns. And they're like, hey, we're going to kill you. That moment, too, also had some revelation that one day with Jesus was a whole heck of a lot better than that moment right there when I'm laying on my face. See, listen, when Jesus comes into your life and you accept the love of God, you will be amazed what he does for you. Now, listen, I'm not going to tell you that all of a sudden you come to know Jesus and you got a Lamborghini. Okay, I'm not that dude. I'm not. But I tell you what you do get. You get the gift of eternal life. Irrefusable. Irreversible. Unattainable without Jesus. That's what you get. But, but you don't understand. Like, I'm going to get to that. Good for you. Why don't you get to it now? Are you a coward? Are you too manly? Are you too much of a prideful woman? Are you too proud as a child? To humble yourself before the creator of the universe that loves you enough that he sent your son to deny that Jesus is the living Savior. And without him, you cannot, you will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. But I'm a good person. Good for you. Well, you don't understand. Like, I tithe 11%. Super special. Well, you don't understand, like, I serve, I do this, I feed the homeless, I take care of people, I'm always there. Well, good, man, that's awesome. That's awesome. But it is all null and void if you do not have Jesus Christ as your living Savior. All you did was something good. Good, I'm glad you did it. But when are you going to quit living for the things of this world that make you feel good and make you feel like you're okay? And when are you going to start living for a Savior that came to this earth and died and got up out that grave for you. Why don't you put Jesus with works? See, most religions will tell you that you have to have faith in works equals salvation. But I'm here to tell you this, that when you know Jesus, salvation equals faith in works. See, you can't do enough to get there. But I'm going to tell you this. If you already know Jesus, you have received salvation. Now the, the result of your salvation is, is a little bit of faith, a lot of faith, and a lot of works. Because the person that you know that doesn't know Jesus, they deserve Jesus. And if you're sitting there right now and you don't know Jesus, you deserve Jesus. He didn't send his son for no reason. He didn't send his son for no reason. He sent his son for you. That's the truth. So today, people, let's not deny the truth that God loves us. And he did not send his son to condemn you. He sent his son save you. Do not deny God his love. The third point that I want to make is this. There is only one way. There is only one way. If you'll flip just a few chapters, 11 chapters, and go to John 14 verse 6 through 7. John chapter 14, verse 6 through 7. And it's going to be on the screen if you need some help. Jesus told him that I am the way, the truth, and the life. Woo! Come on! I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father or God except through me. Remember, the last scripture we read is that through him. 
except through me, meaning Jesus. If you had really known me, you would know who my father is. Remember, his father loves you, and he loved you so much he sent his son. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. See, Jesus is standing before, and he's telling him, you have seen him. Because God sent his son. And he is the only way to heaven. See, you could try all kinds of different ways to get to heaven. In 2018, the number two Google question in Google search engine was this. Can I buy my way into heaven? Can I buy my way into heaven? Think about that. We're looking for the easy way out. But is it true in this Western world that we live in the easy way? I mean, come on. When you got up this morning, you didn't have to worry about random gunshots going through. Maybe you did. Depends on where you live. I get it, okay? All right, but you didn't have to worry about being in Sudan where there's two armies fighting, where you've got the Arrow Boys and you have the AMDs, right? And you didn't have to worry about them coming in the middle of the night and snatching up your kids, putting a gun in their hand, and telling them, hey, listen, you have to kill your parents. So it's hard sometimes for us to grasp that there's nothing more we can do to get, get Christ. So we want to Google, can I buy my way into heaven? Can I put that on 84 months and finance that thing? Can I do it? But that's the world that we live in where we would rather find a way to buy our way into heaven than we would to lay down our sin and accept him. But people, I'm here to tell you right now that there is only one way. There is only one truth. And his name is Jesus. And I'm here to challenge you that if you do not know him, today is your day. Today is your appointment time with Jesus. I'm not ready. I'm not, you're never going to be. But he is always ready for you. He is always ready for you. It don't matter where you've been. It don't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter if you're laying on your face in a poker room. It doesn't matter if you're taking so many prescription pills that you can't see straight. It doesn't matter if you're smoking meth. It doesn't matter if you're cheating on your wife. It doesn't matter if you're cheating on your spouse. Let's just get real. It doesn't matter if you're backing your child support and you aren't paid up. It doesn't matter. Because he's always there to accept you. But listen, there are mistakes that you have made that you still have to pay the consequences for after you accept Christ. Two weeks ago, I had to go testify in court. Two years later, and I had to watch a man who robbed me get sentenced to 30 years in federal prison. See, as much as he was being condemned that day by the world, I was being condemned that day. Because when they put me on that stand and they asked me, how do you feel about what happened that night? I had to be honest. And I looked at the DA and I said, this is probably not the answer that you're wanting to hear right now. I said, but in that video, because there's a video of it, heh, wait till y'all see that. I'm the big dude that jumps on the floor. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'm in the blue shirt, just so you know. I just want to be identified. Uh, another big, big, bald, white dude in the middle, looking like a glowing light bulb. Anyways, never mind. You'll see. It'll be fun. Uh, at that moment, when I looked at at the DA, I said, I'm probably not going to say what you, you're wanting to hear. And he said, well, just say how you say. I said, well, when you watch that video, it's horrible what happened. But that video helped change my life. See, what happened that day changed my life. It was the beginning of my wake-up call. And when I looked at the young man, not quite young, when I looked at the man, and I looked him eye to eye, the man that had assaulted us, the man that had done us wrong. And I looked him in the eye and I said, I just want to tell you, if you don't know Jesus, you better get to know him. It's not because I'm special. 
but it's because I'm living for Jesus as my future. I'm not living at the moment, the anger I was in, the rage I was in. I was living for Jesus. I'm not special. I'm not special. But I want to tell you this. When we walked in to that courtroom, he was an African-American man. And when we walked in, I already knew that he was done. And his family knew that he was done. I, could, I just knew it. And his family looked over at me with this hatred in their eyes. And I don't blame them. That's their baby. But when we left the courtroom, even though he had just been sentenced to 30 years, that look of anger wasn't there anymore. It was a look of sorrow and disappointment for where they were at. Why? Because of Jesus. Not because of me. But if, if you aren't relating Jesus to people who have hurt you and have offended you and have made your life a living hell, you're missing out on a, on a great opportunity for freedom in your life. You're missing out. But it starts with Jesus. It starts with the acceptance of where you're at is not where he wants you to be. And some of you have done the sinner's prayer a thousand times. Like when I was a kid, I got saved every Wednesday night at youth group. And then rolled up a blunt and smoked it on my way home. I mean, that's just being real, okay? That's the truth. That's, that's the real. But see, when I made the decision that I was going to get saved, saved, and I was done playing games, it changed my life. See, the first time... When I, when I really got saved, when I was 18 years old, I came before Jesus as a sexually abused 18-year-old who had been physically abused, who had been neglected and abandoned, who didn't have a high school education, who all he knew was how to play, play games and be stupid. That's what I came to him as. But I accepted him that day in, in the living room floor of somebody's house. And for years, I lived for him. I talked about him. I preached about him. But then I got hurt. I got offended. My brother, at the age of 29, got diagnosed with cancer. He spent 15 months in the hospital. I prayed. I believed that he would be healed. He was young. He had every, listen, he had everything going for him. He was young. He had insurance. <laughs> How many of us know that? That's going for you at that moment. He can recover. He's young. I mean, come on. Look, it's just it's testicular cancer. It's one of the most curable cancers. It's good. It's going to be okay. So I know he's going to be healed. Whether it's through chemo or through Jesus, I know he's going to be healed. And then you get the phone call that the cancer's not just there. It's moved. What do you mean it's moved? What do you mean? Well, we found calcified tumors in his body. He's had cancer for a long, long time. What do you mean? Well, we have to take him into heart surgery. What? Yeah, we're going to crack open his chest. We're going to cut tumors off his aorta. We're going to hope he makes it through. Oh, get the phone call. Surgery went great. No more tumors. Oh, that's awesome. Man, when's he, he's going to get to go back to, to Abilene. And, oh, it's awesome. But there's something we found behind his, behind his uh, chest bone. What do you mean? You said you got a tumor. We did, but he's got a tumor called a Wellms tumor. What do you mean? It's a tumor that's found only in adolescence. We don't know what to do with it. What do you mean? It's, it's in, inoperable. The only thing left to do is to try to kill it. Next to his heart? Yeah. Well, you, don't, you don't understand. Like, first it was, it was curable and easy. Then it was calcified tumors. And now you're telling me that he has a tumor in his body that's only found in kids? Yeah. Well, what do you do when that happens? Let me tell you what I did. I shrank back. Forgot who that was. I lost hope. I lost faith. I lost confidence. That's what I did. And then I got hurt and offended because when my brother passed away at the age of 29 years old, out of all the preachers that I knew, out of all the churches that I had preached at, 
out of the, the, I was kind of popular in Brownwood, Texas, believe it or not. And of all the people I knew, only one pastor showed up. And I didn't even know him. And out of all the friends that I had and the people I had surrounded myself with and all the people that in the church said, I love you. And at that moment, when the funeral happened, none of them were there. At that moment, I forgot whose I was. And I said, well, if the church is that way, then God's got to be that way. And I'd preached about the goodness of Jesus. But there I sat, a broken 26-year-old man with tears running down my face, asking, God, are you real? And then what do you do when you come back to Jesus? You get back into church. And life's still not easy. But before that happens, you get the phone call that something's wrong with your sister. What do you mean something's wrong with my sister? You got to get up here now. You got to. And you drive down, you go to the hospital, and you discover that she's in a coma. What do you do? What do you do? What do you do when you have to make the tough decisions and the tough choices to no longer keep your sister who raised you, who you called Abo? And you have to make the decision that she's no longer going to live on machine. And she has two little boys. What do you do? I'm going to tell you what you do when you don't have Jesus. You get angry. You get bitter. You get disgusted. You get more wrapped up in the sin. You drink more. You take more pills. You try to numb the pain of humanity. Because you've denied the freedom of the Son. But then, God. But then God. See, God butts in and he gets all up in your grill. And he gives you that opportunity to come back. And he says, I know you hurt, son. I know you feel like you're dying on the inside. I know you feel like you've lost hope. And there's no hope for tomorrow. But I'm here to tell you that I am still good. That I still love you. That even though these things in this world have happened, I don't understand them, I don't know, but I'm still good. Will you come to me? I sent my son to die on the cross for you. Will you come to me? And you have that moment. When you get real with God and you don't give ultimatums, let me just give you a hint. You come to him humbly and you say you are the creator of the universe. Every good and perfect gift comes from you. Though bad things may have happened, I know that you still are good. Though I don't know if tomorrow the sun's going to rise, I know that your sun rose. Though I don't know what the future holds, I know that my future with you has got to be better than the hell that I've created by myself. I don't know what to do, but I'm going to trust you because I've done it on my own, and it sucks. It sucks. Do it with him because he wants to do it for you. He wants to do it for you. Because during this season, I am thankful that I serve a risen Savior. I don't care what the stock market does. I don't care what my sales at my work do. I don't care about it. Why? Because I put my faith and my hope and my trust in Him. Kirk, if you would, come on up. Listen, we're going to have a moment where you get real and you get honest with yourself. It's not about your neighbor to your left or your right. It's not about your age, whether you're young or whether you're older. It doesn't matter. Because at this moment, you have got to have a moment where you get real with yourself. Because we don't know why bad things happen. But I know that when bad things happen, I would much rather have Jesus by my side. I don't understand it. I don't know. I'm not that theological 
guy that's going to have the long discussions. I heard a pastor say the other day, he said, what do you do when you get asked the tough questions? He said, I was walking up uh, by my son's bedroom. It was 1 o'clock in the morning. He's 16 years old. And his little sister has special needs. And he, the pastor walks by and he says, hey, Aiden, why don't you go ahead and go to bed, yada, yada, yada. He goes, hey, Pops, can I ask you a question? He said, yeah, sure. He said, if God's so good, how come my sister's disabled? And he said, what do you do? What do you tell your 16-year-old? He said, well, son, you know, born in sinful nature, da, 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 da. And he said his son looked at him square in the eyes and said, oh, that's great. So my little sister has to pay for all the sins everybody else has done. That's cool. I don't know the answers, but I know the answer. I know Jesus. And I would much rather do a day of hard times with him than a lifetime without him. How many of us can agree with that? How many of us from a past who may be a little tainted, a little hard to admit, how many of us can be honest that a day with him is better? Come on. Come on, be real, be honest. We're a hot church. We're honest. We're open and we're transparent. But I want to be honest. I want to be open and I want to be transparent with you. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today is your appointment with him. Listen, I want to tell you, if you say, I, I've known Jesus, but you were like me and you slid away and you're, you're so wrapped up in your sinful nature that you can't see straight. And you think, well, who am I? Because I've known God. I've known what he is. I've known him, but I've backed away from him. Listen, I don't care. What I care about is the moment that you're about to have right now where you come to know him as your risen savior and you get done living for yourself and you start living for him and then you start living for others. Listen, in the seat that you're sitting in are invite cards. They're you belong cards. Do not be so prideful and do not be so arrogant that you can't pick up a card and hand it to someone else because they need to know Jesus. Listen, it's not about you. The cards aren't about filling this place full of individuals. This call, this, these cards are about filling this place so that people can know Jesus. So that people's lives like mine can be changed and transformed. That's what they're there for. Do not deny, first of all, the understanding that you belong. And secondly, the understanding that somebody else deserves that same right. Somebody else deserves to know who Jesus is. If we would all stand real quick in this place. We're going to do things a little bit different today. But I want every single person in here to just take a moment. And I want you to close your eyes. And I want you to bow your heads with no one looking around. Listen, this is not about you if you already know Jesus. It's not about you. It's about the people in here that need to come back to him. Or the people that have never accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. That's what this is about. Because it's time that we stop living for ourselves and we start accepting Jesus for who he is. Listen, I got three simple things. One, Jesus loves you and God sent his son for you. Two, you're not too far gone for him. And three, if you want to know him or come back, raise your hand. Right now in this house, raise your hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Now everybody look at me. We're going to be bold and we're going to take a step. Why? Because we can enter boldly to God with everyone in here. We're not going to do one of the sissy little prayers. Remember? Because our God is strong, strong, strong. We're going to have one of them bold, faithful prayers. And listen, if you raise your hand, I want to tell you this, that it says when you accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, that all of heaven rejoices. I'm rejoicing with you today because your life has changed and it's never going to be the same. So we're going to say this prayer together as a family. We don't do life alone at Connect Church. We do life together. So as a family, we're going to say this prayer and repeat after me. Say, Father God, I am sorry that I have lived in my sinful nature. But I thank you that you sent your son to save me from my sins. Today I accept Jesus as my Lord and as my Savior. Forgive me of all my sins. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. We are so thankful that you came today to know Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Listen, 
we're so happy. We know that God's got big plans for you. Listen, at Connect Church, we say that you were created on purpose, for a purpose. And listen, we want to be a house that helps guide you in your purpose, that helps you find your destiny and what God has called you to be. Because I want to tell you something. God has called you to be something more than what you currently are. That's all of us. It don't matter who you are. He loves you. He loves you so much that he sent his son to die for you. I love you. And I don't even, like, I'm like, here, God's here. There's a big difference. But I want you to know I love you. And I'm proud of the decision that you made today. We're going to enter into worship. We're going to sing a song. It won't be long, maybe a minute and a minute and a half. But that's why I have you standing. Because I believe when people come to know Jesus, we should stand together as a family. And we should worship God. And then we're going to sit down and we're going to do some administrative stuff because that's just how life is. But before we get through all that, let's just worship our God for who he is. Can we do that? Can we give God a hand clap of praise? We thank you, Father. We thank you for what you have done. We thank you. Again, surrendering all, surrendering all. Find me here, Lord, as you draw me near, desperate for you, desperate for you. Lord, Lord, we thank you that today we have made the decision that we surrender to you. Lord, I want to know you more. 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 And Lord, I thank you that everyone in this house today, that our cry is that, Lord, we want to know you more. We want to know you more. Jesus name amen amen and amen if you would take your seats real quick and I know it's awkward we stood we're sitting we're like a Catholic church right now stand kneel stand kneel good news we're not going to pass around a cup and we don't all got to drink out the same cup hallelujah so I want to tell you this uh anytime that we gather we always want to give you the opportunity to not just worship God and the uh opportunity to worship with song but listen we believe that this house is a house that is a giving house amen Listen, we believe that this house should be a house that we reach the community and we give into the community. So there's something I want to tell you that we're doing. We did this last year, and we're going to be doing it again this year. But on December 8th, we're going to take up a special offer. It's just separate from your tithe, separate from what you normally contribute. But we're going to take up a special offering. For people that are in the community, but more importantly, we're gonna, we believe you should take care of your own house first, then reach out. We're going to be helping take care of some, some Christmas stuff for some people in, this, in, the, in the house, okay? Last year, we did it with some single moms, and it was awesome to be able to bless them. It ain't none of your business who they were, but that's what's great about when you give and you trust God, man. And we're going to do that next week on December 8th. We're going to take up a special offering. So I want you to be praying about this week. I want you to pray about what God may put on your heart to contribute to help through the community, to help people out, okay? So we're going to be taking that up next week on December 8th. But in addition, if you would like to just go ahead and contribute to that, we have three ways that you can give here at Connect Church of Abilene, okay? You can obviously give in person. Uh, You can go online, and you can also do Venmo. Uh, Venmo is a really cool way to do it. That's how I do it. It's just simple. Uh, I'm just boop, boop, sh- boom, done. Ha, ha. And then my wife asked me, did you pay your tithe? I'm like, Ch- chill out. Let me check. So I always check and make sure I that it. Uh, but it's a great opportunity. So if you want to give those, those ways, it's simple. Just put on a check or on your envelope that you're giving. Next week is when we're going to take that up. Just put heart for the house. Heart for the house. If you're going to be giving this way, just put heart for the house. Okay, because we believe that we should be a church that has a heart for the house. Amen. Come on. We should be a church that is a giving church. So this is the opportunity now where we get to worship the Lord through our tithe and through our offering. Amen. It's a good opportunity. Ushers, if you would, come on forward. Come on forward. We're going to take up the offering real quick. Uh, Then we're going to do you a favor and get you up out of here. Uh, Don't forget to take the cards that are in your seat. If you need more, there's some empty chairs. Snag the extra cards. Uh, We're also going to be doing the offering this way. If you would, just take the bucket, pass it down, switch it around. hoop de hoop dope de dope So let's go ahead and take up the offering real quick, and then we'll get you out of here. Amen. 
Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. Y'all go in his peace. Amen.